Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to do this inaugural lecture for the Lex Network. Um, in this presentation, I am speaking as a legal scholar, one with a deep appreciation for law as a discipline with a particular set of principles and values. I am also speaking as a feminist theorist, one interested in exploring how the concepts developed in feminist scholarship can challenge and expand legal thought and theory. Of course, I recognize that there are multiple strains of feminist theory. My approach has been influenced by the law and society movement and is currently reflected in the emerging vulnerability and the human condition paradigm, which moves analysis beyond traditional categories of identity, such as gender, to envision a universal theoretical subject. I want to begin with the concept of social justice. And this, of course, is a key phrase that's in use in many progressive circles today. It forms the basis for new programs, conferences, and publications. Interestingly, the term social justice is rarely defined. In the abstract for this speech, I ask what, if anything, does the concept of social add to our ideas of justice? It is with this definitional question that I want to begin. A UN report on social justice in an open world explained that unlike justice in the broad sense, social justice is a relatively recent concept. The term arose with the struggle surrounding the Industrial Revolution and the advent of socialist or social democratic and Christian democratic thought. The report described this era of early industrialization as a time of tremendous economic, social, and political transformation. And social justice was used as a rallying cry by progressive thinkers and activists who wanted to establish rules for the fair and compassionate distribution of the fruits of economic growth, particularly for the emerging working class. So the economic growth that industrialization was bringing distribute that equitably to the working class. Specific distributional reforms regarding, uh, regarding progressive income tax and antitrust legis legislation were in fact formulated, and aggressive policies regarding education and employment regulation were proposed. These policies were designed to encourage and structure the just allocation of the benefits and innovation and growth across society and were to be carried out by designated governmental agencies and actors. The report indicated that governmental intervention to provide economic and social protections that ensured broader public welfare was generally accepted. So that was generally accepted, at least until the 1970s. The report goes on to note that today, although we live in a world of growing and widespread inequality, where consolidation of wealth and opportunity is concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, there is little hope that a collective sense of social justice would be viable in today's ideological and political world. The report suggested that over time, the term social justice had lost much of its social fo focus. Its definition reshaped by the emerging political, economic, and cultural forces. The report specifically addressed the role of a progressive but individual, individually focused human rights agenda, emphasizing formal equality and individual liberty. And that played a role in redefining notions of social justice. So justice is now to be found in the promotion of the individual and the formulation of rights not in the generation of ideas of collective responsibility and defining and implementing the public good. Equality and liberty are entitlements of the individual constructed as barriers against anything that might interfere with or impede choice or autonomy. This this complicates and confounds the idea of state action to affect something called social or collective justice. 
Individual rights are not the only potential barrier to the social justice perspective, however. Neoliberalism, which of course is located on the opposite pole of the political spectrum from human rights, also propelled the shift to an individual rather than a collective conception of justice. Neoliberalism grew out of classic liberalism, but departs from it in one very significant way, the role envisioned for the state. Both liberalism, classic, and neoliberalism endorse the, endorse the principle that freedom, justice, and societal well-being are best guaranteed by a system that protects private property and promotes open markets and free trade. So both believe that. However, however unlike classic liberalism, neoliberalism does not mandate the state be restrained in the interest of securing individual liberty. Rather, the state is invigorated and reoriented to serve the market, to secure and enhance individual economic opportunity through the market. It's a radical theory in which the market becomes the key mechanism for ordering society and distributing its benefits and burdens. <clears throat> and in order to best perform that task, the market must be empowered and protected from socialistic influences or collective interference. In the words of perhaps its most influential proponent, Milton Friedman, neoliberalism proposes that it is competition that will lead the way. And he concludes, the state will police the system. It will establish the conditions that are favorable to competition. This again is market driven, not socially driven justice. In the words of another neoliberalism, another one of neoliberalism's ideological architects, and this is Frederick Hayek, the word social is redundant. Justice is what a free society produces through the market and through competition. He also said that the greatest service that he could render would be to make people thoroughly ashamed ever again to employ the term social justice. Hayek was not successful in banishing the term social justice, but perhaps he would not object to the way that it is currently used. Over the course of the 20th century, justice increasingly became understood in terms of the relationship between the individual and the economic. And this is true across the political spectrum. Close to a consensus revolves around two propositions, at least rhetorically. First, society has a fundamental responsibility to equalize and facilitate opportunities for individuals to engage in productive economic activities of their own choice. Second, and economic and social rewards are justly distributed when that distribution is the product of individual talent, initiative, and effort. Socially insured opportunities and options provide freedom for the individual, the freedom to consume as well as the freedom to determine what one does with one's own life to maximize economic potential and social position as one defines it to create your own version of the good life. This consensus is rooted in economic opportunity and built around individual agency, merit, and initiative. Of course, some con uh, concessions may be made and must be made in recognition of a need for a social safety net for those who are unable to participate due to circumstances beyond their control. And the system has had to recognize over time that unwarranted obstacles or distortions may arise that inhibit some individuals from competition or unjustly deny them equal opportunities. To address such distortions, law prohibit discrimination based on individual characteristics, such as gender or race, which have been deemed irrelevant. There is not a great deal of agreement about whether or not these anti-discrimination measures are effectively implemented or whether they ever can be. Many argue that bias and discrimination are pervasive, now less, although now less explicit and direct. 
new concepts and categories have emerged, such as systemic or implicit bias or disparate impact. There is debate about just what differences beyond sex and race should be deemed entitled to the protection of an anti-discrimination provi provisions. Even if the existence of discrimination is conceded, there are arguments about what are appropriate remedies. Can we justify affirmative action in the, in the context of an anti-discrimination model and how? Is there any merit to the idea of reverse discrimination? What about reparations? My question is different. How can feminist legal theory assist in this struggle over what constitutes social justice? I wanna begin with a few words about the nature and importance of legal theory in, as the context for my feminist analysis. Again, because I am putting my feminist analysis in the context of legal theory. Legal theories generally rely on identifying a universal or generally applicable legal or constitutional set of principles. Law is universally applicable to all in society. Law establishes the legitimate social and institutional structures that operate upon everyone within society. This universal principles principle is exemplified in sayings such as no one is above the law or concepts such as the rule of law and equal protection of law. In, as part of this process, a legal system constructs a legal subject, the subject of law, which is the imagined ordinary being around which law and policy is built. The authenticity and integrity of this devised being, the legal subject, is crucial. The ideal legal subject should encompass the totality of human experience. If it does not, some set of principles must explain why some are not included with this within this ideal subject of law. For example, we exclude children due to their perceived differences in capacity and ability. Of course, as we know, historically gender, as well as race and other categories of difference, were used to justify different treatment for some within society. So while the fundamental constitutional principles in the 19th and early 20th centuries was that of equality, a specific logic of separate spheres and fundamental sex differences mandated placing women in a special category, a special legal subjectivity. Laws created distinct, a distinct legal subjectivity that affected the way that both state and individual responsibility were defined. Law placed women under the control of their husbands and fathers, and the state's obligation to women as admittedly secondary citizens, special citizens, was fulfilled by supporting the patriarchal family. So state responsibility support the family. We were not excluded as constitutional or legal subjects, but treated as a special category of subject in need of protection and therefore properly sheltered within the mediating institution of the patriarchal family. This exclusion was not considered discrimination in the negative sense of, that we think of it today, quite the contrary. Women as individuals were perceived to possess unique characteristics and abilities, and thus to have a different but indispensable social role in the reproduction of the next generation. Many of the exclusionary rules were erected to protect or support women in successfully assuming that role. In this way, individual biological sex was aligned with the set of particular gendered social practices and then formally institutionalized within the family. Significantly, the creation, of ma uh, creation and maintenance of a sacred separate sphere not only formed a refuge for women, but also was the way that the state manifested both its authority and fulfilled its responsibility to reproduce society. So through this categorization of women, creation of the family, placing them in a special category, the state fulfilled its responsibility to reproduce society. 
Today, of course, thanks to feminism, women are no longer legally defined by reproductive roles or family status, but recognized as full and equal constitutional subjects. Formal gender equality has transformed most areas of law. Gender neutral language replaced gender specific designations and preferences based on assumed gender differences have been successfully challenged in courts and legislatures. Even within the family, gender neutrality and equality are now the guiding principles. Today, we live in what might be called a post-gender equality world where, at least from a legal perspective, equality has vanquished discrimination. Women now have full constitutional subjectivity. Reforms of family law have transformed husbands and wives into spouses and fathers and mothers into parent. And there have been marked improvements in the social, economic, and political position of many women over the past 50 years. And it's important to recognize that progress improves situations are in fact and, and have happened. But many would argue that the delegitimization of gender exclusion and discrimination has not resulted in either gender equality or gender justice. Some commentators suggest that such inequalities, residual inequalities, are the result of something called structural bias or unconscious discrimination that's related to gender stereotypes. But I think the problem is more complicated than the concept of discrimination can capture. Rather, it's a problem of distribution and mechanisms of distribution. It's a distortion in the allocation of responsibility across societal institutions. Law has liberated individual women, both formally and symbolically, from predetermined distinct gender roles, but it is not clear who or what now has responsibility for the societal preserving tasks, this responding to human dependency, historically assigned to women within the family. And I want to return here to the concept of legal or constitutional subjectivity. This is a modern Brooks Brothers version of the legal subject. The ways in which we think about the individual in relation to the collective society has not significantly altered from that of an er earlier era. Dependency remains privatized, invisible, untheorized. Here we see a, a fully functioning and self-sufficient adult. This constitutional subject demands only the liberty and autonomy that will enable him to provide for himself and his family as he sees fit. The society uh, designed around this subject, whether the subject is male or female in form, is one in which competent self-interested individuals manipulate and manage their independently acquired and overlapping resources, exercising a range of options in pursuit of their individually defined good lives. If he fails, the fault is his individual responsibility, certainly not that of the government or the larger society. Order is brought to this world through contract, a private process in which autonomous individuals make choices and define the extent and nature of their own relationship with each other. The form of government that's best suited to this constitutional subject is limited and restrained. Liberty for the individual dictates a presumption of inaction on the part of the state. I suggest that reforming this individualistic manifestation of the legal subject should be a central component of a feminist project of social justice. In this regard, it is crucial to realize that it was not only it, that it was not the mere exclusion of women from full constitutional subjectivity that needed to be remedied by feminist reformers during the 20th century. So it wasn't only the exclusion of women, but the problem was more than exclusion. The creation of separate spheres and a special uh, domestic legal identity for women 
also facilitated and legitimated the exclusion of a whole range of fundamental human experiences from public or constitutional concern, prevented those experiences from being incorporated into how we understand individual and collective responsibility, how we define the legal subject. These historic, gen historic gendered roles were more than just empty designations. They reflected a reality about the human condition. We are embodied, fragile, material beings. As such, we are dependent throughout life on institutional structures and relationships. Importantly, dependency should not be theorized as primarily negative, but as generative. The impetus for us as a species to come together in families, communities, to form political organizations, both local and international. Our dependency is the very basis for society and its institutions. It must also be central in defining social justice. In infancy, we are inevitably dependent on care from social institutions such as the family. This is a biological or developmental dependency, and it is, of course, universal. In addition, there is a second form of dependency, which I call derivative dependency. The caretaker is dependent on resources in order to successfully accomplish their social role as caretaker. This is a socially constructed dependency. The resources a caretaker needs may come from within the family, a spouse, a partner, a grandparent, but they also must come from other societal institutions, which introduces a third form of dependency, uh, on structure, a structural interdependency. The family as an institution is dependent on other institutions. Its success is linked to the successful functioning of other social institutions. And this includes the educational and healthcare systems, the employment system or market institutions more generally, and of course, the social welfare system. Dependency is complex. Individual dependence on social institutions is constant, although it varies and fluctuates. We depend on different institutions and relationships over time as there are changes in our situation and circumstances. For example, the birth family recedes and other institutions typically become more prominent later in an individual's life when the need for care arises only occasionally, such as when we're ill or injured. In other words, individual dependence on any specific institutional arrangement can be thought of as episodic, alterable, and circumstantial. However, it's important to recognize and theoretically address the reality that dependence on some set of social institutions and relationships, be they market, financial, and employment systems, or educational and healthcare institutions, is inevitable and ongoing for everyone throughout life. A robust feminist sense of social justice must be built upon this fundamental realization. An embodied socially dependent subject should be at the center of our theories, displacing the contingent rational man of economics, the reasonable man of law, as well as the contracting man of political theory. Our new legal theoretical subject should be the vulnerable and dependent subject. I'd like to end with a chart where I try to visualize um, the theoretical approach that I'm taking. And I think that a feminist social justice approach would really have two levels of analysis and engagement, and both would incorporate a robust sense of collective or state responsibility. First would be the institutional level, and you see this at the, the first level in this chart. The social institutions and relationships upon which we depend are created and maintained by the state. They are the products of law and policy. These institutions allocate privilege and power, they distribute risk and reward, subsidy and investment. And so you see the state at the top of that chart and then what's distributed underneath that. They confer recognition and structure accommodation, supplying the often essential arrangement for 
arrangements for future generations, <clears throat> as well as those generations that are already in existence. In order to effectively provide individual and societal benefits, these institutions must be designed to work together. So you see these circles, these institutions, uh, education, finance, family, and so forth, that they're overlapping. Their relationship is symbiotic and complementary. For example, early feminist work in the family demonstrated how and why changes in the family had to be, to be in order to be successful, demanded corresponding complementary changes in employment and welfare systems, for example. All right, so that's the first analysis across these symbiotically arranged social institutions, first critical engagement. Second, on an individual level, within these institutions, individual social identities based on social fact functions are fashioned and enforced. And you see that at the second where we're talking about social identities on the chart. Importantly, these social identities are paired and complementary often of necessity unequal relationships. And here we have parent-child, employer-employee, shareholder-consumer, doctor-patient, lender-borrower, and so forth and so on. And in fact, most social identity relationships, paired relationships, are inherently unequal. Different social functions, different expectations. Through these identities, the social benefits and burdens of the re reproduction of society are distributed to individuals using everyday law, contract law, corporation, employment, family, criminal tort law, and so on. Laws that affect everyone in society, apply to everyone in society. The question at this individual level is not, are these relationships equal? They're inherently unequal, but are they just? Who is privileged and who is disadvantaged and why? And does the justification for that inequality in privilege and disadvantage? Does it make sense in terms of the way the institution is operating? This of course can change. And here's an example, in husband and wife in the family context, the social identities of husband and wife used to be inherently considered unequal. And that of course changed as the result of feminist agitation as we already uh, have seen. However, that those relationships, those social identities were replaced by different social identities that still performed those roles, that of caretaker and dependent. And again, caretaker dependent social identities are relationships that are inherently unequal. So in answering this feminist just, social justice question, my analysis is anchored in dependency. My answer is not, or at least not always, equality but rather accommodation, support, and subsidy. I do not primarily consider the individual, although that's certainly relevant, but emphasize the institutional, the institutional arrangements and within the institution, these social identities. I am concerned about the distribution, not of rights, but the distribution of responsibility and the way that that is enforced and operates throughout society. Is that just? Is that fair? And that to me would be a feminist social justice analysis. So I wanna thank you very much and um, I'm happy to answer questions if you have any.